All right, so uh, this is a talk about the new representation. The uh, uh, acronym SDD stands for uh, Sentential Decision Diagrams, as opposed to uh, Binary Decision Diagrams, and we'll see the reason for this uh, name in just a little bit. But first, a little motivation on why is it that at least I and my group are looking for another representation. And uh, let me mention that this is part of um, work on knowledge compilation, which has been going on for some time, where we uh, try to find compiled structures of uh, knowledge bases uh, that allow us to answer certain queries in, in polytime. And uh, there's been quite some work on this subject um, uh, over the years, and a number of uh, languages have been identified that would qualify as compiled structures. Uh, I'm going to mention two of them in particular, uh, OBDDs, which we all know about and have been quite influential and have been actually developed for a very long time, and also uh, the more recent uh, representation, deterministic DNNF. Um, the idea is that uh, these different representations vary in terms of their uh, power and succinctness. So OBDDs are extremely powerful, they give you a lot of um, operations in, in polytime, uh, but they tend to be somewhat bigger. Uh, deterministic DNF are a superset of OBDs. They give you less power, but they tend to scale better in terms of size. So the idea is that if you don't need the power of OBDs and the power that's given by deterministic DNF is good enough, then probably that's what you want to do, because you can scale better. And actually, there's a lot of uh, examples now in the literature over the last few years where people are doing this instead using deterministic DNF. Uh, so, what do we need here? Why are we looking for more? What actually I've been working on with my group for quite some time is navigating this space in between OBDDs and deterministic DNF, trying to find something here that has a particular property. That's proved extremely difficult, and we've had many successive uh, 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 progresses over the years, but uh, the, the one thing that I'm trying to chase is a fragment that's as close to deterministic DNF as possible in terms of being general and succinct, but that has these two properties that have made OBDDs extremely uh, popular, canonicity and polytime apply. So I'm going to just mention uh, that apply is the ability to take two elements of the language and combine them by conjoining and disjoining in polynomial time. And the reason that's important is there's a whole set of applications that require that. And if you do not have a polytime apply, you cannot use it. So, the, the language that I'm going to mention now, uh, sentential decision diagram, have these two properties. And I'm going to talk about the importance of canonicity towards the very end, on the last slide. If I don't, make sure you ask me, because that's very important. Okay, so here's SDD. I'm going to introduce them somewhat uh, pictorially by starting with OBDDs and telling you what is it that we generalize to get sentential decision diagrams. So I presume people know OBDDs, they're decision diagrams, the variables here are binary. And if they're true, we go this way. If they're false, we go that way. Uh, uh, and they terminate in either one or zero to tell whether this particular instantiation is a model of the formula represented by this ABDD. ABDD we simply uh, follow, and in this case, we're terminating by one. That means this is indeed the model of that particular formula. Okay, so this is uh, all these. What I'm going to show now on the other side is just another way of notating OBDDs, which could not make sense. This is a better notation. However, I'm going to use the new one because it's the one that we're going to adopt when we move to sentential decision diagrams. And here's the notation. So decision nodes now, like this one, look like this. Uh, think of this as OR. I can go either way, this way or that way. Think of these pairs as AND, this and that. So if A is true, I go this way. If A is false, I go that way. And the decision node looks more like this. And moreover, I'm going to call this guy A and not A. I'm going to call them primes, the primes of the decision node, the, the conditions upon which I decide to go this way or that way. And I'm going to call these guys here the subs. So a prime, sub, prime, sub, all right? And we're going to see why this uh, makes sense. So the next slide, we're going to see a picture of a sentential decision diagram. And we're going to see that it results from making two generalizations uh, on the OBDD, and then we'll go to the theoretical properties and see why we care and so on. Let me just mention, a key property of the OBDD is that the variables are always respect a particular variable order. So there is a particular order, in this case, A, B, C, D, and, and that's a characteristic feature of OBDDs, the variable order. All right, so here's a picture of a sentential decision diagram, uh, but for a different function than the one on the previous uh, slide. And we're going to see that it generalizes an OBDD in two particular senses. The first one 
is that decision nodes are no longer binary in that case. Here's our first decision node. This decision node has three outcomes. So in general, uh, it could be an arbitrary number of outcomes. But the other important thing is the primes are no longer variables or their negations. They're no longer literals, as we've seen of OBDDs, but they're arbitrary sentences. So in this case, we have three outcomes of the decision. Each outcome is a prime and a sub, prime, sub, prime, sub. And if you look at these primes, uh, they are, as I said, arbitrary sentences represented recursively as STDs. So if we unfold uh, the meaning of these three primes here, we're going to see that they look like this. The first one is A and B, not A and B and not B. And these three primes are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, and that is a requirement. So the definition of a decision node is that it's a set of pairs where the left parts are primes, sentences that are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, we call them primes. And because of that, given an instantiation, one and only one of these would be true, and then the subs are basically where we go if that particular branch happens. So we generalize in the notion of a decision to not being just binary and to branching on sentences as opposed to uh, just simply uh, literals. So this is the one first generalization. The other generalization, remember that OBDDs are characterized by variable orders. STDs are characterized by a more relaxed structure, which is a tree. So here are the variables, and this particular tree, again, these guys are just for illustrations. Uh, we call this a V-tree or a variable tree, and it characterizes uh, STD in a particular way. These decision nodes are not just arbitrary, but they have one more condition on them. This decision node respects that particular V3 node. What does that mean? That means the primes of that decision node must be here over variables in the left subtree, and the subs are sentences over the right subtree. So the, the primes and the subs speak about different variables, and those variables are in the left and subtree of a V3 node. All right? So that's basically the SDD. You'll see the formal definition in the paper, and uh, and you'll see in a little bit how the OBDD is a special case of this in a very precise uh, sense. In fact, if we use what we call a right linear V trees that look like this, where the left branch of every node is always uh, a, a single variable, you will basically get OBDDs because primes in that case will always be over a single variable that is a literal A or not A, and you get the guy that looks like this, which we've shown notation is just an OBDD. Right, so why do we care? Right, we have a whole bunch of uh, other generalizations that people have been building over the years. Uh, beyond this nice, and you see it mathematically later, uh, even a sharper characterization of, of, of SDDs and how generalized OBDDs, we care because they are canonical, and you see why. Very nice reason for that. They do have a polytime apply operation, also impressive. They come with a tighter bound on their size. OBDDs have an exponential in path width. STDs are actually exponential in tree width. And I'm not going to say more about this. You're going to find the, the proof in the paper where it shows you what particular V3 to use so that you can get this guarantee. The question that remains here is, are they more succinct, meaning exponentially? But I'm going to leave this till later to tell you. We have half the answer to that question. Okay, so it, it's the, the representation and properties is just remarkable. Uh, what happened? What is it that made this stuff comes come out? And it's this definition that I'm going to show you on this slide. And it, it is the, the result of making an incremental improvement on a definition that we've been working on for some years. The notion of an X partition. Take a function f over two sets of variables x and y, not overlapping. So all of the variables of f are now partitioned into x and y. And let's decompose that function or write it in the following way. As a bunch of components that mention only x, a bunch of functions that mention only y. This is a conjunction, so h and g. And this is a disjunction. Write it like this. This is a notion that we introduced last year and we call it an xy decomposition of the function. All right? Now, we add one more condition. We require that these H's here form a partition. That means they are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, and they cannot be false. When that happens, this decomposition will be called an X partition of that particular function. X partitions characterize STDs, as you will see now, in a very precise sense. 
and are responsible. Their properties are responsible for all of the properties that SDDs obtain. And I'm going to give you two theorems later. Next one shows you why we have canonicity, and the other why we have a polytime uh, apply operation. But notation, we notate this typically using sets where the elements of the set are. Um, excuse me. Each element is a prime and a sub. Remember, we call this guy a prime. The guys that have to be mutually exclusive and exhaustive, the partition, we call them primes. So every pair is a prime and a sub. And then we have this uh, particular yes, notation, OK? And, and it's used heavily in the paper. This is the first result that gives us canonicity. We will say that an X partition is compressed if it does not have any equal subs, meaning you cannot have two of these G's that are equal. If that's the case, it is called compressed. If it's not compressed in the sense that maybe G1 and G2 are equal, we can always compress it this way by disjoining the corresponding primes and copying the, you know, one of these guys. Now, the main theorem is this. For a function over a split of its variables, X and Y, there is a unique compressed X partition. Once you take the variables of the function and divide them into x and y, and you tell me, get me a compressed x partition, there's only one. And that's why, as you see next, you, you get the canonicity. Remember this example. This example is for this particular function, right? Now, the minute you drew this particular v3, you have told me, I'm going to start representing this function or decomposing it by splitting its variables into an x and an y. We know that there is a unique compressed X partition where X is A and B, and it happens, <coughs> excuse me, it happens to be this one. It has three elements, three primes, and three subs. What does that mean? I've already determined my first decision node. Done. There's no choice. Now, the three subs and the three primes will be recursively represented in the same way by decomposing them further. And the V3 tells me how to do that. The primes will be decomposed using this subtree, and the subs will be decomposed using this particular subtree. You keep doing this until you hit boundary conditions, and we got our STD. Right? OK. You know that OBDDs, or have heard, are characterized by what's known as the Shannon expansion. The Shannon expansion is just an X partition when the set X is a singleton. When it's a singleton, I only have two primes, X and X prime. And the two subs are the condition or the sub functions, f given x, f given not x. And this is basically the partition that I have. And this is why when you have right linear v-trees and use this, you actually get open trees. Okay? Why do we have a polytime apply operation? Because of the following theorem. If I have this x partition of the function f, and if I have this x partition of the function g, guess what? The x partition of their composition, f sur g, where CERC here is any Boolean operator, is this. It's a Cartesian product, effectively, of these two guys. So this is size n, this is size m, you get n by n. And that's basically, the rest is standard techniques uh, for proving that you have a polytime. Uh, but I have to mention here, caution. This guy may not be compressed, even if these two guys are compressed. So this apply will give you a quadratic time, uh, but, but the result may not be compressed. And I could not, and I've tried quite a bit to bound the case when we have compression. So to do compression, you just have to make a recursive call to disjoin primes when subs are not equal. But that version of the algorithm, and you see the details in the paper, I could not bound that one. So short story, in OBDDs, reduction, reducing, generating, reduced, and canonical OBDD can be done pronominally. In this case, that's an open question. All right, guys, I'm almost done here. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about this relation, what we know about the relation between the sizes of STDs and OBDDs, and I need this notion. Here's a total variable order like you have in an OBDD. We can dissect it into a V3, right? Just make a cut, make this left, right, and keep doing this recursively. Clearly, you can dissect an order in many ways, and these are two possible dissections of this particular order. So here's what we know so far. Interestingly enough, if you just take an OBDD, take its order, and dissect it almost randomly, literally randomly, you tend to actually get quite a bit of reduction in size. And you see the experimental results in the paper of that. Just random dissection. But 
A sharper thing, which is unpublished, but it's recent work with uh, Yijang Chu and Arthur Choi, we have shown a class of functions where the OBDD for a particular order is exponentially sized, but if you dissect that order, the corresponding STD is actually linear. I'm basically done here. Uh, this is the conclusion in your representation. Uh, how am I doing on that? Good, okay. Uh, this is the representation. It generalizes OBDs in a very sharp way, using trees instead of orders, branching on sentences instead of literals. It has interesting properties, canonicity, and, and quality time apply. And remember, there is a pending question here uh, on this, this part. It comes with a tighter bound using tree width than uh, path width. And at least we know that dissecting the orders into V trees and going from binary to, the, to sentential uh, can lead to exponential reductions in size. But I just want to end with the very last thing. It's why am I so excited about this guy and why I feel like phew, finally we got to a place where I've been trying for a long time. Here's the deal. Compiling, there, there's two sides to this game of knowledge compilation. Finding interesting languages and trying to compile into these languages. Now, there's OBDD, it have, have its own CUD compiler that everybody uses. There's DNNFs, which have the C2, C2D compiler that people have been using. One of the very interesting points is whether the compiler, how close it is to being optimal. Meaning, when it gives you back a compilation for a particular formula, there could be multiple compilations. Is it bringing you the smallest possible? Playing that game of compilation is very difficult. In OBDDs, it was made very simple because the OBDD is characterized by a linear order. That means navigating the space of compilation is a process of navigating permutations. It's a large space, but very nicely well defined. So when people do dynamic uh, variable orders, they start with one, and if they find that it's too big, they start actually adjusting or navigating the space of permutations. But on this side of the compilation that corresponds, or the OBDD that corresponds to the order, there's nothing happening because it's fixed. There's no search space on the side. When you modify your order, there's one way to modify the BDD. Otherwise, if there's multiple ways, then you have two search spaces, which is the case for most previous works. Now, with this fragment, if we want to do dynamic search trees and search for them, we have set the grounds for a similar game. The space to navigate in this case is the space of trees. All I have to worry about is modify trees and incrementally modifying them. On this side where I have my SDD, there is no search, all right? There is just incremental modifications to these in a deterministic way. That, dear audience, make a huge difference, and that's why OBDDs have excelled, because there's almost a dozen, if not two dozen, heuristics and methods that people have found to dynamically find orders because the game is so nicely and elegantly well-defined. So I hope, I hope, that we will uh, be in a similar situation uh, with this uh, with this line of work. Thank you.